Hello, and welcome to Spring Security 6, the next generation. My name is Rob Winch, and I'm the project lead for Spring Security. And um, if you haven't seen it yet, there is a QR code in the uh, lower right-hand uh, corner along with a link. I'm also going to drop that same link in the chat. If you would like to visit that, you can, um, you can uh, go ahead and Okay, uh, you can go ahead and uh, check out the source code. This um, this presentation is only one slide. The rest of it is going to be live demo and uh, coding. All right, so with that said, we're going to go ahead and skip over to our demo application that we've put together. And here you can see I've put together a very simple application. The application is intended to be simple so that we can focus on spring security rather than a domain model for uh, the application. And in this application, we're using spring security six or uh, spring security five, and we're going to see how we can migrate to spring security six and do that incrementally. And then along the way, we'll also check out some of the features in spring security. So, here you can see we have a public page. Again, nothing very complicated. We click on the user tab. It asks me to sign in because I'm not logged in yet. And this is just the default Spring Security login page. So I log in here. And if I uh, now I'm able to see the user page and I can kind of toggle between those. I can also log out. And that's all there is to our application. Again, we're doing this very intentionally so we could focus on the interesting bits, which is Spring Security. So how do I migrate to Spring Security? How do I how do I do that? Well, the way that I the way that I can do that is um, the way that I can do that is um, bring up my IDE, and in my IDE I will uh, see that I have a build Gradle file, and my build Gradle. I'm on the latest Spring Boot 2.7, and I also have a um, property overriding Spring Security's version, and that property is Spring Security 5.8.8. So now that I've uh, overridden that property, I'm using that. And the reason why I'm doing that is because Spring Boot uses Spring Security 2.7. Spring Boot 2.7 uses Spring Security 5.7. But Spring Security 5.8 has some additional features that make it easier to do a gradual migration to Spring Security 6. And it is compatible with Spring Boot 2.7. So I override that property. And at this point, you might think to yourself, well, how do I know that that's what I'm supposed to do other than the fact that you're telling me that? Well, that is a good question. And fortunately, we have a very detailed uh, steps for how to migrate to Spring Security. You can see here, I'm on Spring Security 5.8's docs, and it tells preparing for Spring uh, for 6.0. And the very first step is update to Spring Security 5.8. Now, if you're not aware of how to get there, if you land on the, the current documentation, in here you can see there's a migrating to Spring Security 6, and then it links to preparing for Spring Security. So, all of this is laid out in the documentation. We're going to go over some of the migration steps, but this is going to vary based upon your application, what features you're leveraging. Um, and so you're going to want to go through these docs on your own as well. And while we're at it, I don't know if you've seen the new Spring docs, but this has been kind of a little side project of mine. So I'd like to take just a second to show it off. We have great navigation in, in the new Antora-based documentation. And you can see that I can navigate. There's like a hierarchy. We have breadcrumbs. We're able to navigate that readily. We have, uh, if you have a larger project um, or a larger page, you can get uh, navigate to there, uh, different points in the page. You can edit the page. If you find a, a error with the page, you can submit a pull request that way readily. Um, and then there's also the ability to search. So I can search for test, and you can see all the testing related pages in Spring Security. I can also um, navigate to uh, any other projects. 
different versions within Spring Security. And there's even a search for all of Spring Docs. So I can search all the docs and you can see Spring Shell has testing, Spring Framework has testing, and it takes me directly to those pages. So hopefully if you haven't checked that out, you will. Um, it's, it's starting to pop up everywhere. And hopefully um, this new navigation will help your spring experience uh, as much as I, I think it will. OK, so now that we've done that, what are our next steps? We aren't going to go through the guide, as I mentioned before. We're going to just kind of navigate the code at this point, but know that all of this is documented. So the next step we're going to do is we're going to remove Web Security Configure Adapter because that's removed in Spring Security 6. And you can see that it's deprecated. So we'll just go ahead and delete that. And Obviously, if the override is it, it's no longer overridden, so we'll change that to a bean. We'll change this to Spring Security. This you don't really have to change this to Spring Security, but I just kind of like to do that because it makes more sense. And then we'll go ahead and return the result of HTTP.build and use our IDE to fix that. So now that we've done that, we now have a um, we now have a uh, one step done. And typically, I would recommend that you restart your server, run your tests, make sure everything is working. But you know, this is a demo. We don't want to be toggling back and forth between all this all the time. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to continue forward. But normally, you should commit your code after each incremental change and validate that everything works again. All right, so now we're going to do authorize HTTP requests. And this seems like a very small change, just changing a method name. But really, what this is doing is it's switching over to Spring Security's new Authorization Manager API. If you're not familiar with the old way of doing things, the old way, there was an Access Decision Manager. It had voters, and there was uh, config attributes. The new Authorization Manager API allows us to easily do custom authorization so much so that we can just do it as a Lambda. And in fact, we'll explore that later on in this presentation. The next deprecation you'll see is ant matchers. And if you're not familiar with it, there used to be ant matchers and MVC matchers, both of which are deprecated. And we have this documented in the reference documentation. And it talks about if you have a controller, a spring controller that has slash admin, and you use ant matchers, you're actually going to probably have some vulnerabilities because Spring will also expose URLs like slash admin.html, slash admin slash, et cetera. And so we recommend you using the MVC matchers. The problem with this is that a lot of people saw examples on Stack Overflow. They copy pasted. They didn't realize the MVC matchers was there. So it was hard for users to actually get this right unless they read through all the documentation. And so in Spring Security 6, we deprecated this in favor of request matchers. And request matchers automatically selects the right answer for you. So in Spring Security 6, you won't see MVC matchers. You won't see ant matchers. You'll only see request matchers. And Spring Security is going to select the right one for you. Again, we use these opportunities to migrate to more secure defaults uh, when we migrate to a major, re uh, provide a new major release. Another thing that is interesting is that we have this, um, we have this authorize HTTP requests and everything, but we also have this and. And the and is deprecated as well in Spring Security, uh, later versions of Spring Security 6. You don't have to do this before Spring Security 6, but in Spring Security 7, we're no longer going to do this and DSL. And you might say, well, what what is that? And what is the and? If you're not familiar with it, when we created the, the uh, Java DSL, it was before Java 8. And so there were no lambdas. And we wanted things to look very similar to the XML namespace to make it easy for people to migrate. So you'll see there's form login, looks like this form login, login page, looks like login page attribute, failure URL, a little shorter, but similar to failure URL. And this and was not just to make it similar to this closing tag, but it also provides similar behavior. You have to, only these attributes are available for form login just like only these are available for the XML element. So in order to chain this together, 
you have to have an and to switch context. And so that's what that and is. But the problem with that is it causes confusion for our users when you get multiple nestings. So fortunately, we can do better now that we have lambdas. And we can switch over to a lambda-based DSL. And so this is a little easier for people to read and keep track of the nested layers. If you don't have any customizations, you can pass in with defaults. And here we can do the same thing. And then the other thing that we did in Spring Security 6 is um, if you don't have a rule defined, it's going to be deny all by default. And this just makes sure that you don't forget to define all your rules. So here, the other migration step that we have is we need to define a rule for slash. Um, and then we'll say permit all. And in Spring Security 5.8, if you didn't have that rule, it was just by default permit all because you didn't define something. In Spring Security 6, there's an implicit deny all for everything that was not mapped. So now that we've done all of that, it's a great time for us to go ahead and check to see that everything is still working. So we'll go ahead and restart our application. And actually, there's one more thing that we need to do. Configuration. Uh, configuration needs to be on here uh, with proxy beans method false so that we can get our AOT support because in Spring Security 6, we don't have this configuration annotation here anymore so that people can customize that property and to better align with the rest of the Spring Security or the Spring portfolio. And this will still work because we haven't migrated to Spring Security 6 yet, but we'll go ahead and give that a test because we did we did make a lot of changes here. So you can see I can go here. Everything is still working as expected. We're still able to log out. And that's good. Now we're going to make one more uh, change. This is another thing that Spring Security does in its documentation is it walks you through how to, um, how to uh, opt in to features that are on by default in Spring Security 6. Um, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to check and see uh, if we restart our CSERF token or our application here, that if we restart our application here, now we come back to our application. And if we view the page source now, so earlier, you, you might have missed the audio earlier, the CSERF token was not changing every time I refresh the page, it will refresh. It will change if I my session expires, I log out or log back in, but it does not change every request. And now you can see that it actually is changing. And the way that works is there's random bytes at the beginning that's base64 encoded, and there's the CSERF token at the end that stays the same. But those random bytes are XORed with the CSERF token. So the whole thing appears to change, but we're using the same CSERF token. And this is to protect against an attack called breach. Breach is a type of side channel attack. And if you're not familiar with side channel attacks, side channel attacks are attacks that is a flaw that reveals extra information due to a flaw in the protocol or algorithm um, and how it's implemented. And so Breach basically exposed a problem with how HTTP compression was happening. And the way that you fix it is by disabling HTTP compression. Um, but we can protect our CSERF tokens by, again, rotating that value every time because it needs to have multiple responses, the same value, and it also needs to have uh, control over the page results. So if I type in uh, hello world and I'm searching for that in Google, hello world will be reflected back in the response in that it'll say, you search for hello world. So that's, uh, and so anything that you type in the request is then reflected back in the response. And so because of that, uh, this page could have been uh, exposed to breach and the CSERF token could be exposed. And you might say, well, breach has been around since 2012. Why are you just now fixing this? Well, this is really just a, a defense in depth mechanism because any secret can be exposed. This includes like a social security number. It includes a, um, you know, your bank account number, anything that's private, which presumably if you're logged in, everything is going to be private. And so in order to make that, uh, in order to make that so that we're 
um, uh, having the defense in depth, we add that protection, but really you need to disable HTTP compression or the other mitigation you can do is use heal the breach, which basically randomizes the response enough that they cannot actually figure out what those secrets are. Um, but this is something that's enabled by default in Spring Security 6. And we walk you through how to enable it explicitly so you can test that out individually rather than an all at once sort of scenario. Okay, so now that we have done that, we are going to um, re uh, stop our application and we are going to update to Spring Security 6. So in order to do that, we first just go ahead and remove the explicit configuration for five. And then all we need to do is take the latest version of Spring Boot. And we're gonna just go ahead and do the latest milestone, the milestone of uh, Spring Boot. So we'll go ahead and uh, refresh that. And we'll go ahead and start up. And actually we can go ahead and do this too. We'll go ahead and remove that because this is on by default. And uh, we'll go ahead and we won't restart uh, incrementally because uh, it's a demo, of course, it's gonna work. So instead we'll go on to our next thing. We're gonna show you how you can easily add authorization using a Lambda in Spring Security. So we have these easy methods. One of them is authenticated, but we can also do access. And this access allows for me to pass in a interface called the authorization manager. And we're it's it's very simple. So we can actually just do it as a Lambda method which is what we'll do here. The first method argument is the authentication object. If I wanted to say, does this user have roles or is it a particular username? I can use that authentication object to get the authorities or get the credentials, the details, the principal, anything like that. However, um, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna do something really silly. We're gonna do an authorization decision based upon the context, which allows access to the request and we're going to just see if if the request requ uh, contains the parameter of granted, then we'll grant access to it. Of course, you would never do this in production because it's the craziest requirement. Uh, why would why would it require the parameter of granted to determine granted? But you can see with this how easily it would be to implement your own custom authorization. So here I have access to uh, the user page, if I go to, uh, if I click on the user page, it's gonna ask me to log in because I'm not logged in yet and I don't have, I'm not authorized. And now when I log in, it's gonna fail because it doesn't have that parameter. But if I say granted, it now lets me have access. And if I log out, in fact, and I go back to that page, you can see it makes tries to make me log in because I'm not logged in anymore, but I, I could just do granted and now I have access. So it's a very silly authorization rule, but it shows how easily we could customize this for our own authorization requirements. And in fact, rather than doing something so silly, let's see how we can use OPA or Open Policy Agent to make custom authorization decisions to, um, to determine if our application should be authorized. And we can externalize our authorization decisions using OPA as well. So the first step that we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new file and that file is going to be in the folder OPA to just kind of keep it organized and we'll call it example.rego. Rego is the expression language that Open Policy Agent uses. And in here, we're gonna create a package, Spring. So this is just the syntax for Rego. This keeps much like Java, Spring is the way to isolate it to kind of its own namespace import future dot keywords dot in and spring could be anything that we wanted we're going to use that import later um, but for now we're just importing it and we're going to define something called allow this is something that we chose but it's going to be false by default um, allow could be anything that we wanted but we're, that's what we chose to do it's like a variable and we'll say it's true and it's true if the count 
of grant is greater than zero. And we'll see more about that later, but just know that uh, if grant, if we have something that says it's granted and it, there's more than one grant, then we'll allow access. Then we'll have a has role. This is a helper method that we're going to define. Um, and we'll call it concat. Uh, we're going to call this concat method from future keywords in. And then there's no way to concatenate a string, so we have to do it with a list. Um, and so that list is uh, role underscore and then the value that was passed in. And now we can say, is that concatenated value in input? Input dot user dot authentic, oops, authorities. So input is a keyword that that's something that we pass into the rules engine. And then user authorities are uh, properties. And we'll see we'll see that in action in just a minute. So now that we've done that, we need to define a way to grant access. So this is just a textual description. User has role user. And now we'll define the actual rule. So if input, again, that's our keyword, request.uri property in the input is equal to user, then we will say, and it has role user, then we will grant access. So this is this is what we're saying. If grant is greater than zero, we will grant it if these two things are true, has role user. And this has role is, again, using this helper method. So then we'll also create another grant. And this is if it's slash, it's allowed. Sorry about that. Periodically, my headset will turn off since there's no sound coming through it. Um, grant is, uh, we will grant access to slash um, input.request.uri. Um, so we will grant access if the URI is slash. And here we don't need a role because we're granting access to any user. So now that we've done that, we can start up our rules engine. And we'll go ahead and bring it over here. And we're just going to start up OPA pointing at that file. And you can see we have no errors. Um, in our configuration, uh, uh, or at least no syntactical errors. And now what we're going to do is we're going to run a REST uh, request against that, uh, and we'll see what happens. So here, I run a REST API call, and it passes. Again, input is what we're using. So it's input.request.uri, and that is the user is the URI, and the authorities are role user. And that corresponds to that role, that rule that we set up for a user. In fact, you can see that it allows access. That's the variable that we chose. Allow is true. And it's granted access because slash user has role user. So this is kind of that textual description that we saw earlier. So all of that correlates to our configuration file. Now that we've done this via a REST API, we can, um, we can uh, go ahead and create a, a client using Spring to interact with that and then plug that into the Spring security authorization uh, APIs. So to do this, we're going to go ahead and create a new, a new interface, OPA service. So we'll, we'll create, this is using Spring's new support for, um, for uh, proxy-based REST clients. And we're going to just create some Java records that look just like our requests that we created. And you could map this however you wanted uh, using custom Jackson mappings and stuff like that. But we're just going to we're just going to duplicate this uh, structure that we saw because it's the easiest way to kind of follow along with what's happening. So this is uh, this is kind of our request input that we saw earlier record. There's the input is request, request, user, user. So that's that's the input. And then this is going to be our response. So you remember we had the namespace of spring um, and the, in there. Um, Boolean, uh, let's see, Boolean allow. Um, and then record. Uh, result spring spring 
And then we have record response result result. So again, this is just our this is just our data structure. And um, then we have post post exchange v1 data. And then in here we have we're just going to return our response. And we'll call this method check access. You can call it whatever you want. And then we'll do request body of the input input. So now that we have that, all we need to do is create a proxy object using our Spring configuration. So we'll create a OPA service configuration. And on here, we'll need to create a configuration. Um, and then we'll create a bean. And then in that bean, we want to make sure that we create our OPA service. So our OPA service has OPA service. And this is a little bit of configuration. And um, this is going to get easier, I think, because there's an issue out on uh, the Spring Boot forum, uh, Spring Boot issue tracker to make this a little easier. So I think it's going to get a little easier, but they're working through some of the details of how to do that with still ensuring that we have the flexibility that we need. So we're going to make this localhost 8080, or sorry, it's 81, 81. Um, and you could externalize that property if you wanted, but we're not going to do that today because uh, we're just trying to get through our demo here. REST client, and then we'll do REST client equals REST client dot builder, and we'll do it from our, our uh, stuff there. And we want to make sure that we have our URI builder factory new default. URI. And there is actually a little way uh, way to simplify this a little more already, but I chose not to do that because it allowed my testing to work, and um, I didn't want to use the snapshot that fixed that issue. So um, this will get a little e easier for sure because you can create the use the REST client builder um, to make that easier. So we'll create a REST client adapter, create from our REST client, and Finally, we will create a HTTP service proxy factory. And then that factory, we will say service factory builder um, builder four. Um, and that builder four is the adapter. And now that we've done that, we can return factory dot create client OPA service. And that was a bit of configuration, but remember, this is actually all we need to do to implement our REST API. So let's go ahead and create a test to see how that works. We'll create a new class, and we'll call it OPA service tests. And in here, we'll, we'll make it a Spring Boot test, and we'll make it a test, void go. And so in here, we just want to make sure that we have uh, that everything's working before we try to integrate it with Spring Security. So we'll auto wire a OPA service, OPA service. So now that we have that, we can use this method right here. Um, we can use uh, that. Uh, we can create that. Um, create that uh, request that we saw earlier. So we'll do input, input equals new input. And then we want to do new request. And that'll be a request to slash user. And then we'll want to say new user. Um, and we'll say user, role user. So that's that's basically mimicking the REST API calls we were doing from the command line earlier, but now with our REST uh, client. And then we're going to say this.opa service dot check access input. And then we want to assign that to response. And then we want to assert that response.result.spring.allow is, uh, is true. And then we need our static import. So now that we've done that, 
uh, hopefully everything works out just fine. We'll run our test and make sure that it's uh, our test passes. And our test does pass. So that means that our client is successfully implemented. Now we just need to implement that using the OPA, the authorization manager. So we'll create a Java class and we'll call it OPA authorization manager. And our OPA authorization manager is just going to use that client that we created. So we'll start by making this a component just to, oops, I'm going to create it as a component so that it, um, so that it uh, is picked up as a spring bean. And we're going to make it uh, implement uh, authorization manager. And it's going to be a request so that we get get the correct content context. So how do we implement this? Well, again, we said we're just going to use the OPA service, um, OPA service, and then we're going to add a constructor here. And then we can actually uh, borrow some of our code from our test here. So all we're going to do is we're going to grab this, and we're going to paste it into here. And rather than hard code things, we're going to actually use um, use our, our property. So the request, we have to use we'll get context here. So we want to get request URI equals context.get request.get request URI. And then we'll need to get our string principle equals authentication.get.get name. OK. And then after we've done that, then we'll need to get our authorities. And we'll get them as, a, as an array. So we just say authentication.get. And then we get the authorities. Um, whoops. We'll stream that. We'll stream that. And then we will map it to um, granted authorities. Uh, dot get authority, and then we'll make that to array and string new. And now we can start substituting all that stuff in. So here you say we have the user. We'll just do uh, or the request URI. We'll do request URI, and then the principal instead of hard coding that, we'll say principal, and then the authorities. We'll pass that in. Authorities, and then of course we're not asserting things anymore. But what we will do is we'll return a new access control decision, and we don't need that as true anymore. And now that we've updated that, we need to update our Spring Security configuration to take advantage of of that. So in our Spring Security config, we'll go into here and we'll pass in the OPA authorization manager, and we'll just call it OPA variable. And instead of our request matchers um, like that, we can just say any request is access with OPA. So now we've externalized that. So now we'll go ahead and try to restart our application. Oh, we have to return that value, of course. And start that up now. OK, so now that we've done that, the other thing I'll do is we'll, we'll look. So here you can see we have just a few requests. Um, but we'll make some interaction with our application. So I'll start off by going home. And it's granted access. And you can see that I'm getting additional requests to the to the API. The API is uh, logging out that it's allowed access. And then if I go to user, it makes me log in. Um, and then I can toggle between those, and I can log out. So you can see that it was very easy for me to provide custom authorization and then actually provide a meaningful 
uh, real authorization model. And that's actually all we have for today. So I, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining me. And if you um, are trying to migrate to Spring Security 6, again, I uh, encourage you to visit the Spring uh, Security documentation. And uh, it will walk you through how to uh, update to, oh, this is a Spring Framework documentation, um, the Spring Security documentation. And it will walk you through how to migrate to Spring Security 6 uh, in those steps that we uh, took a look at. So once again, thank you. And uh, I think we can hand it over to uh, Dan if he is around. OK.